Dr Glenn Richardson is Professor of Early Modern History at St Mary's University, Twickenham, London, where his work concentrates on monarchy as a form of government and ideals of princely rule. He is also the foremost expert on the field of cloth of gold, having studied every aspect of the event for decades. He is a Fellow of the Royal History Society, a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, and is an Honorary Fellow of the Historical Association. His books include The Field of Cloth of Gold and Renaissance Monarchy, The Reigns of Henry VIII, Francis I and Charles V. He is also the editor of Contending Kingdoms, France and England, 1420-1700 and co-editor with Susan Doran of Tudor England and its Neighbours. His next book on Thomas Wolsey will be published later in 2020. I began by asking Glenn about his background. Well, I'm originally from uh, Australia. I did my first degree in history at uh, Sydney University a long time ago. Uh, and I was considering various options when I finished that. Um, but in my last year, I met uh, David Starkey, the Tudor historian. And um, within about a year or so, um, I had um, been offered a place to be his uh, PhD student at uh, London School of Economics, which is where he was then. So I came over from Australia. Seems quite amazing now. But, um, the things you do when you're young. And um, uh, so I was with him at LSE for about four years and I did my dissertation on Anglo-French relations in Henry VIII's reign and I spent about a year in France, uh, mainly in Paris, um, researching there. Um, after that I took various part-time jobs in lecturing and eventually became a lecturer in history at St. Mary's and was a May professor in about 2015. Um, and here I am. Uh, the Tudor history, was that a deliberate choice or did that sort of happen uh, It was a sort of sequence of events? Given that I was coming to, I was interested in Tudor history and given that I was coming to England and I had to sort of rapidly bone up on, on what I had known about Tudor history. And then, of course, I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do when I got here. I was thinking I might end up doing something on Anglo-Italian relations like Venice and England. But um, David said that uh, perhaps it would be more interesting to do Anglo-French stuff because much less had been done on that, which was right. There was a lot done in the 1980s about um, Italian Renaissance influence in England. Um, so I having leapt off one sort of tree, I then leapt off another into, <laughs> into Valois and, and uh, Tudor English history. But I, I, don't, I don't regret it. Uh, it was good. What attracted you to writing a book about the field of cloth of gold specifically? Um, well, in the course of that research uh, back in the 1990s, I uh, obviously encountered the field of cloth of gold as an aspect of Anglo-French relations. And even at the time, I didn't really know much about it when I first you know, read about it. And it, even at the time, it seemed bizarre. Um, and there was something about it that engaged my energies. Um, people uh, who wrote about it uh, said, oh, this was a colossal waste of time and money. It's just one of those weird things that happens. You know, it was the past. And I thought, hang on. And even then, and, and, and subsequently, coming back to the, 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 the key to your, your the, the question, is people don't spend the equivalent of something like um, 15 to 20 million pounds in our money for three weeks entertainment unless it really means something. Or at least I wouldn't if I had 20 million to throw around. Um, and I thought, if you look at it as a, as a kind of window on the mentality of the Renaissance, it, it's almost like a, a three-week little theatre piece. Why do they do the things they do? What do they do? Why do they do? What do they think they're doing when they're doing it? So that fascinated me at the time, but there wasn't space in the dissertation to, to go into it. And But I always said I'd come back to it one day, and, and as we got into the 21st century and as 2020 began to loom, uh, the book was first published in 2014, uh, and then the publishers have brought it out in paperback for the anniversary this year. So I started to look at that, and um, I, I found it really interesting when I did. Just remind us where and when it happened. Uh, well, the event took place between June the 7th and June the 24th, 1520, 
and it took place in uh, what was then the uh, Pale, what the English call the Pale of Calais, um, after Edward III's conquest of, of Calais in 1347, they, they were given by the Treaty, I think, of Brittany, I think, um, about a hundred and something square miles of, of territorial uh, protection for Calais, essentially, um, which became English, English France. Um, and so the meeting took place uh, on the border between English France in a little town called Guine, um, which is still a little town full of farming machinery and things, um, and a similar but slightly grander town um, called Ardua, uh, which was then in France. So it was more or less right on the border. And they built a tournament uh, tilt yard uh, at some point, which has never really been able to be located um, between the, the, the two towns. Um, both sides erected temporary lodgings for the entourages which they brought with them. Uh, Francis I, who was King of France at the time, he'd been king since 1515. Uh, he built a, a sort of hotel particulier within the town and also put up magnificent huge pavilions. Um, we talk about tents, but they were actually groups of tents put together and then covered over with uh, extremely expensive fabrics like velvet and silk and cloth of gold, which gives the event its name. Uh, and the English did likewise, they put up tents, but they also built a, a temporary palace, which uh, was a hundred feet on, uh, on, on either side, um, uh, around a square. And uh, it had uh, banqueting halls and uh, day accommodation, wasn't for, for sleeping in, but day accommodation for Henry, and Catherine for Carver Wolsey and for Henry's sister, Mary Tudor, who had been the Queen of France briefly when she was married to Louis XII in 1514. So both that, that's the sort of the outlying area where, where they were. Why did this event happen? It happened uh, to inaugurate a peace agreement and a peace treaty that had actually been signed two years earlier in 1518. Um, it um, was a tournament. Uh, it, it, people think of it as, as a summit or as a, as a kind of political meeting. It was and it wasn't. It was, strictly speaking, a tournament. The, uh, the peace treaty which it inaugurated or celebrated was the Treaty of Universal Peace agreed in 1518. By about 1517, the Ottomans had moved into the Middle East and had conquered Syria and Egypt and were threatening what is modern Iran. Pope Leo X, uh, the Medici Pope, uh, said that, you know, something must be done about this terrible problem um, and uh, proposed a, a truce between Christian princes uh, so that uh, they could fight not each other, but the, the Ottomans. Cardinal Wolsey, who was then the Lord Chancellor of England, uh, and he was made a cardinal, he was made a legate, he, he was already a cardinal, and he was made a legate, um, which is a papal plenipotentiary for Leo. And rather to Leo's consternation, he decided um, to make uh, the thing into something even more elaborate, which was a non-aggression pact between all European princes, to be uh, led not by the Pope, but by Henry VIII. Uh, and uh, amazingly, everybody signed up for it. The nearest modern equivalent that I can think of is, is probably NATO, uh, in that it's collective security, everybody signs up, uh, aggression against one is aggr aggression against all, everybody defends one, and any internal disputes are arbitrated, not by the Pope, but by Henry VIII and Wolsey. Uh, so that was the, that's the main thing, but to give it a, a force and to give it a, a point, um, it also incorporated an Anglo-French alliance. Um, the uh, English and French had been briefly allied, as I said, uh, when Mary Tudor married Louis the, the Louis the Twelfth, um, but that hadn't really come to very much. So this was a renewal of that alliance, which was pretty dramatic in itself, if you think about it, because you know the Hundred Years' War was not that; it was only 30, 40 years earlier. Um, and uh, to have England and France, the great ancient enemies, allied in support of universal peace was terrifically um, uh, engaging. It was, it was a kind of uh, 
spectacular political coup. The, the, the world had changed kind of thing. And that gave momentum and drive to the wider universal peace. And one of the terms of that agreement was that the two kings would meet and they were due to meet in 1519, but for reasons which we may come to, they couldn't. Uh, and so they eventually met in the summer of 1520. So was it a kind of communal idea or did anybody sort of drive it? Did Wolsey drive it? Who, who sort of organised it all? Uh, it was very much Wolsey's, the whole thing was very much Wolsey's creation. The universal peace that I've just been speaking about, the Anglo-French alliance, and the fact that it should be spectacular to, to give, to, to draw attention, particularly to Henry VIII. Um, Henry had um, uh, attacked France in 1513, and so he was sort of around, but the accession of Francis in 1515, um, and Francis's very uh, quick conquest of not just a couple of towns like Henry had managed in Northern France, but the entire Duchy of Milan, which was in effect the whole of Northern Italy, um, rather put Henry in the shade. And this was Wolsey's way of trying to bring Henry back into it. Um, Wolsey was trying to impress upon Francis um, Henry's potential, either as an ally in the new scheme, or if it failed, as uh, an enemy. Francis responded in kind for his, his own reasons. Um, in order to make it compelling, they brought with them huge numbers of people. About 5,000 people on either side were brought together. Uh, members of the nobility, the gentry, and their servants, their families, and everything were all brought together for this event. Um, uh, and in the English case, it, it required quite a bit of uh, logistical organization, because whereas the French could just sort of constitute themselves at Ardra, more or less about the time of the... Um, of the event, the English, of course, had to be shipped across. <laughs> so they all had to be written to. Uh, and there's one letter that survives. It was sent to a fellow called Adrian Fortescue, who lives um, in Stoner Park um, up in uh, the Thames Valley, saying that he should appear with, I think it's 10 stout yeomen, properly apparelled by the 5th of May or whatever. And then he would be part of Catherine of Aragon, the Queen's entourage. So hundreds of these letters must have gone out, you know, open the morning post, hello, <laughs> I'm going to France. Why? <laughs> In the you know, the start of the summer, I guess the, the harvest is on, um, Parliament's not sitting, so you're off for your holidays or looking after things, and suddenly, you know, you've got to pack your bags and, and um, head to France, um, or to English France, if I can put it that way. So it must be pretty weird. I mean, it must be, that they all assemble at the end of May in Dover, so... 5,000 people in Dover on a, in a couple of nights at the end of May 1520. I mean, the, pub, the pubs would have been full, um, it would have been really quite something. And, and then they're all shipped across, probably not in all in one go, but in, over a couple of days. Um, there's a painting at Hampton Court uh, called The Embarkation at Dover, um, which shows the English sort of going over probably for that event. Just the whole organisational, the money that's spent on this thing, the building of the temporary palace, as I alluded to, the, the uh, equipping of knights and everything to take part in this tournament, was a, a spectacular demonstration of English and or French potential for good or ill. At the centre of all this, two, two sort of peacock men, Henry and Francis. I mean, it is, it is like a sort of... Um, it is a bit like Putin and Trump. I mean, I mean, who's who? There's, there's a definite showing off going on. The, 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 these these two men at the height of their powers. I mean, talk to, talk talk a little about these two guys, Henry and Francis. Yes, you're right. Um, uh, they are two. I think they are impressive figures. Um, um, in, in 1515, which was the year that Francis became king of France, so he, he became king at the age of about uh, 20. Um, and a Venetian ambassador who had been at his court to, to uh, on behalf of the Venetian Republic, congratulate him on his accession, then went to England and met Henry. And he wrote an extraordinary letter back to the Venetian Republic saying, the like of two such courts and two such princes have not been seen by any Venetian ambassadors that have come to these countries for the last 50 years. You know. So they were already Im impressive because they were you know, young. Both of them were tall in their own terms, you know, handsome, glamorous. Um, and Henry, of course, had, been, had become king in 1509. 
and at the age of 17 and had just wowed Europe with this, you know, um, this, uh, and you read the accounts of his early court and it's like Camelot, you know, jousting and feasting and hunting and, you know, uh, married to Catherine. Uh, they have a child who sadly doesn't live, Prince Henry. Very, so they were, uh, they were real. Think, I don't know about Trump and Putin, but, but think of, of the Kennedys or something in, in both instances. They were, they were the glamour couple, um, you know, Obama or whatever, <laughs> the, the glamour couple of the time. Uh, and they were very much aware of each other. Henry was very aware of Francis because uh, he's younger. Um, and as I've alluded to, he, he very quickly made a spectacular conquest in, in Italy. So he'd sort of shown Henry up a bit. Uh, and so Henry was very much motivated by a, a personal um, a rivalry. The same ambassador, the Venetian ambassador to which I've referred was treated at the site of the king's leg at one point. Um, that he, uh, he, he was talking to the ambassador and Henry said, you know, has, has the king of France a, a good calf to his leg? And, and the ambassador tactfully says, oh, well, you know, spare, that is thin. And then Henry pulls the doublet back and says, you know, that's, have a look at my leg, you know, tell the King of France about this. So it really is, it really is a kind of, um, well, uh, the word I've been forced to use on occasions is bromance um, between these two. There's rivalry, but I think actually they did actually like each other. They were jealous of each other. They were often angry with each other. They had a very long relationship, um, longer than most of Henry's marriages. Um, but, um, uh, it went until they both died in 1547, this lifelong rivalry. Um, but I, I, the word I've used is ambivalent about them, that in, in the true psychological sense of the word, in that they could, there were positive and negative aspects of their relationship, unlike the relationship with the third person who is really part of the story, that is Charles V, Charles von Habsburg, who was at the time the King of Spain, He'd been elected as Holy Roman Emperor in succession to his grandfather, Maximilian, and he inherited claims against Francis I in Italy and in Germany and all over the place. Um, now, Henry was quite ambiguous away in his relationship with, with Charles. Um, he, he was his nephew by marriage because, of course, Charles was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon and on which much would later turn. Um, but he wasn't that you know, interested in him. Um, uh, and, and between Francis and Charles, there was, I think, more or less unrelenting hostility. There was no real admiration of each other at all. Uh, it was just a, a, a straight up political fight and, and they were enemies throughout their whole lives. Um, they did have a later a couple of brief interludes of peace, but, but nothing like what happened between England and France. So, yeah, I mean, they I think it's true to say that, that a lot of, of what drove the field of cloth of gold was the personalities and the, um, uh, I suppose, the, the determinations, the agendas of the, of the two young kings. Did it, did it achieve what it, what it was he wanted it to do? How long did that achievement last? Uh, well, there's a number of ways of looking at it. In the short term, I think it did, for the reasons I've been saying. Um, there were descriptions published, uh, people knew about it. There were ambassadors from Venice who are, you know, uh, amazing. A, a lot of, most in fact, of what we know about the field and a lot of the early reign of Henry is due to the, uh, don't go to <laughs> Kew, go to uh, Venice to find out because the ambassadors' reports are so detailed um, about all of this. So. Um, uh, it did achieve its, its immediate goal of, of focusing attention on Henry and Wolsey and, and really shaking things up and, and making Henry seem, at least, a very important European king. Um, in the uh, medium term, for reasons I've just alluded to, it didn't really work because the rivalry between Francis and Charles always outweighed the, the potential for cooperation with England. Um, uh, a year, well, less than a year later, in the spring of 1521, Francis is desperate that the longer he waits, the greater the power of Charles will be, not so much to attack France, I don't think he's worried about that, but to start taking some of the territories in Italy and other that, that Charles has claims on, including Milan. And so he tries a, a kind of, if I was, if I was a Francophobe, I'd say a, a typical Gallic trick, 
but since I'm not, I won't say that. <laughs> but it was a bit silly anyway. Um, he has he has a subversive a subversive attack or a covert attack on Navarre, um, imperial territory in Spain, and also uh, in uh, through Sedan through the lordship of Sedan. Um, and not surprisingly, Charles counterattacks quite vigorously uh, against this this aggression. And Francis immediately says, oh, help, I'm being attacked by this terrible Emperor Charles, you know, um, help, help, um, I'm the innocent party, to which Charles says, well, I'm the one who's been attacked. This uh, affords Wolsey another opportunity to be grand on the international stage. He convenes a peace conference at Calais in 1521, which goes for about two months. Um, and probably not, he'd not been there two days before he realised that really... <laughs> Um, in a fight between these two, and it was going to be a fight, and there was nothing that they could do about it, uh, Henry had better be on the winning side when it was all over. And so that's why within 12 months, um, Henry is allied to Charles, and there is a second English invasion in 1523. So no, it didn't bring about universal peace. Um, however, uh, two things, in, in the longer term, it certainly set the tone for Anglo-French relations, which were important. Don't forget that within a few years, Henry will decide that he wants to have his marriage to Catherine of Aragon annulled, which will catapult his relations with Charles into big trouble and, of course, the papacy. And then Francis is, is in a sense, his, own, his only ally. Um, and although the alliances and they're renewed in 1525, they're renewed in uh, 1527 and 1532. Uh, so, and all the way through, it's difficult, it's fractious, it's, um, like I said, ambivalent. Um, they're one minute they're sending each other um, pasties made of deer, which they've hunted. The next minute they're threatening to war and all the rest of it. So it's a real, well, Anglo-French relations. Um, it, it's a real topsy-turvy, but it holds. And it also is important culturally, I would argue, uh, because as a result of the dissolution, well, the, the break from Rome and then the dissolution of the monasteries, by the 1540s, Henry is incredibly wealthy. And he's also had the, the buildings which belong to Cardinal Wolsey, like Hampton Court and Whitehall Palace, as it becomes. Um, and a lot of the building, the decoration, the kind of um, ways of showing off the magnificence of his monarchy uh, in the post-break with Roman world, are influenced by what his good friend and brother, as he calls him, uh, Francis, is doing at Blois, at Fontainebleau, uh, at Saint-Germain-en-Laye in Paris. You know. um, so there's a real cultural dialogue between the two of them. A lot of French artists who work at the French court come to England. Um, uh, so in, in that longest sense, it, it, it had a real import but I have not tried to argue in the book that it somehow was a, a magic solution to um, international conflict. But then can you show me one in the last thousand years of, or 2000 years that has actually worked for a very long time? The general reader picking up a history book doesn't really understand the difference between a historian writing from primary and secondary sources. And also, I know you have languages as well. It, it, it's uh, to get to the nub of something these sources are important aren't they yes um i mean the, the general process is obviously that you begin with the secondary sources uh what everybody else has written about it and and that's how you inform yourself about what the issues are uh, in any historical subject you're looking at um and then uh in order to either better inform yourself or to try and it's not easy um, in certain ways to to, to say something new or to find out more about it, you need to go back to the original documents, which is what we call primary sources, um, which are which can only speak for themselves in their own context. Um, so, uh, and th there's nothing like, uh, I suppose, it, emotionally, it's it's the, the the thrill of of our concept of the past of of I, I've had it myself, and then I'm sure people know what it's like to pick up an object that's 500 years old or whatever. Um, and I and I remember um, you know looking at letters of Cardinal Wolsey or Henry VIII, and there it is. There's the actual paper that was written on. There are the pen marks made by that person, and there's just nothing like it. <laughs> um, so I guess that's what drives, um, and it's fun being a, a, an historian of the 
uh, late Middle Ages, the Renaissance period, because there's enough of it, and you know, uh, without being overwhelmed by it, I don't know how historians of the 20th century cope with the sheer amount of stuff, newspapers, and you know, everything which they've got to to deal with. Um, but beyond that, it's things, for example, like um, when you get down to that level, not only do you have that immediate sense of immediacy, and the thing is what it is, and you you have a sense that it's there for you to interpret, and and that that's why there is no such thing as a history of any subject, because the past is the past, and the remnant of the past is because Henry VIII did write that letter you're looking at. But what it means, how we should understand it, changes from 1920 to 1960 to 2020, um, according to what you've read and the what everybody else has made of it. So. In that sense, we're always reinventing um, uh, the past. And when you get down to that, that sort of micro level, things like drafts, for example, one of the things that, that I said about David Starkey, my supervisor, impressed upon us all as, as uh, research students, was to look at drafts of things. Because it tells you an awful amount. You know, they, and, and they do survive because, of course, when, for example, somebody like Cardinal Woolsey would send a letter to Henry, he would send a letter, but he'd keep the draft which he'd written, perhaps several drafts. And so you can see, obviously, the, the scratchings out and the, oh, so he thought that, but he thought he wouldn't say that. Um, and that's when it gets really interesting, and that's where the interpretation is. So that's why I think for, for any um, good writing, um, you, you need to sort of have as much uh, engagement with the primary sources as, as possible. Um, although we're very blessed with the fact in, in Tudor history, for example, that in the 19th century there was a, a big program to uh, produce uh, printed versions and, and, and summaries of, of all these documents, without which we wouldn't know where to start. So we're greatly indebted to, to the Victorian concept of history. But again, what's interesting is when they wrote those um, summaries of, of these diplomatic documents and Wolsey's letter to so-and-so or Cromwell's letter to such and such um, it's what they leave out, which is also interesting because it tells you a lot about their conceptions of what history was like and when they were doing it. That can't possibly be important. Um, it's it's just a, a, a washing bill, you know, that's still nothing. Now, of course, we're, ah, give me that. <laughs> it tells you the cost of washing. It tells you what kind of material, that, which they weren't remotely interested in because it wasn't high politics and statesmanship. But we are now, cultural history, etc., we're now desperately interested in the content of a washing bill. So <laughs> there you go. So now you've turned for your second book to the Cardinal mm. himself, Cardinal Wolsey. Yes. Yes. Why did you choose that as your next stepping stone in this? Well, in a way, you've, you've put your foot on it, as it were. Um, it, it was a natural stepping stone um, uh, from the field of cloth of gold and, and Henry's international relations, which I've been doing for my doctorate and, and in various other edited books and things since. Um, Woolsey, Woolsey, Woolsey's there. And he's, he's equal, to my mind, he's, he's the most fascinating... Uh, of Henry's servants and, and courtiers, and I, I would call him a courtier as well as a statesman, um, because he's such a contradictory figure. Although we don't know very much about him, he stands in so many ways on so many different juxtapositions. He's the, the most powerful <laughs> individually created thing or, or person in, in the reign of Henry VIII. Um, Cromwell comes nowhere near him. You know, I mean, he is the Archbishop of York. He is, uh, the, for a time, a Bishop of Lincoln. Um, he's a Bishop of Winchester for a time. He's Abbot of St. Albans. He's um, a Cardinal. He's uh, the Lord Chancellor of England. Um, no other person has ever been uh, created by a monarch in quite that way. Even the great Cardinal ministers of, of the French court, you know, one thinks of... Um, uh, Richelieu and Mazarin, they, they were not like a Woolsey, and yet, like Cromwell, um, of course, Cromwell gets into the circles of power through Woolsey, working for him uh, on his dissolution of monasteries, um, not Henry's, on, on Woolsey's, to uh, find the, the, the proceeds to um, set up, for example, Cardinal College, Oxford. That's how, that's how Cromwell starts. But both of them are... Um, working class 
boys, you know, they're, they're from working class backgrounds. Cromwell's father's a blacksmith. Um, Wolsey's father is a is a you know part time uh, tavern owner. Um, he's a, runs a butchery business, got a few cattle, etc. Um, he's a bit of a, a, a sort of <laughs> Jack the Loud um, or um, only fools and horses kind of character, I think, in Ipswich. Um, the old boy kind of thing. Um, and uh, and yet these two lads, through education, one in the law, the other through theology, um, uh, in Wolsey's case, uh, be, uh, flourish and, and um, become uh, what they are. And I think that's the key to... It tells you a lot about Henry as a king in two ways. A, that he's a very good manager, he's a very good delegator, he's an incredibly good picker of talent. Um, and he, he is an intelligent... I, I don't like Henry VIII very much, and I find a lot of what he does just repulsive, and, and he's a, an awful character. But I can't... I would never say, for example, that you know he's like Trump or something, which I've heard people say. He's not. Um, he's a highly intelligent, very... Uh, complex and complicated and, and troubled individual. Um, uh, but he's, a, and one of those talents is, is picking very good people. Um, and he sees in Wolsey, I think, much as Wolsey sees his opportunity with Henry, he sees in Wolsey a person who is absolutely, A, dependent upon him, but also trustworthy. He knows, because Wolsey has no agenda for his own he's got no family he's he's not like an italian cardinal who's got you know 20 cousins and three brothers and and everybody wants to be uh, such and such he's got nobody you know he's got a, 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 a what we might call a common law wife and by whom he's got two kids who you know he tries to do his best for but that's he's not some you know uh, as i say it, italian cardinal like the medici or the um estense family or anything um, so all that talent, all that energy which Wolsey has and that capacity to do anything everywhere for, for Henry and apparently do anything that Henry wants is utterly focused on Henry. That, of course, is Wolsey's tragedy, which I try to bring out in the book, is um, he's trying to serve two masters. And um, as uh, Christ warns us in the New Testament, <laughs> we can't really serve two masters. And... and that's what he is doing because for he is, as, as Peter Gwynne put it in the title of his biography of Wolsey back in, in the 1980s, he's the king's cardinal, as I've just been saying, for the reasons I've said. He's absolutely committed to Henry. He does, he never goes to Rome. He, he, he's not interested in the papacy. It's all about using the, the power which the church can give him in England and internationally for Henry's benefit. And he does miraculous things. You know, we've talked about the field of cloth of gold. Um, he gets money, millions of pounds out of Francis I, uh, paid to Henry for the peace, the various peace agreements they have. Um, he uh, reforms the church. He, he sets about you know, educational reform. Um, he does all of that. At the same time, he's telling the papacy in Rome, anything you want in England, I'm your man. You come to me. I'll, I'll look after you. Know. Um, he's, got, he's got his Italian cardinals who are appointed to English benefices, people like Gennucci and things, in Rome working away for English interests. But of course, he's not there himself. And wouldn't you know it, the only thing that he can't do is when the king and the pope are absolutely a dagger's drawn, and one cannot do what the other one wants, and he's right in the middle, having for 15 years told um, the Pope that he can do anything that Henry, that, that he wants in England, and Henry that he can do anything he wants in Rome, both of them turn and say, well, deliver. And he's absolutely caught between the two of them. Um, and, of course, as we know, that, that results in his, his fall in, uh, in 1529. That's what's so compelling about it, that... Um, he would have done anything and everything he possibly could have for Henry, and did. And the one thing that he just cannot do is the thing that means the most to Henry of anything he's ever asked him. So there we go. Well, I got quite carried away there. <laughs> but you see why. I, I, I do get caught up with him, and, and I, I have a great deal of, uh, I, you know, it's a myth that historians have to be um, 
impartial. I think I think you have to be judicious. I think you have to be balanced, and you have to see both sides of the argument. But um, I think there's a much more historians have, have much more in common, say, with barristers than they do with scientists. In that they're both using evidence, and and you know you have to stick to the facts, particularly academic history. Unlike, if I may say so, a lot of popular history that gets written, you have to stick to the facts. But within that, you are putting a case. You are arguing. Um, for a particular view, and that that seems to something about Woolsey draws that out of me to to want to do that. It, it, it so. seems that writing the book at the end of it, you were almost more passionate about him than you were when you started. Was, was that the yes? Yeah. Yes, I, I think for the kinds of reasons that I'm um, thinking about. Um, uh, uh, Woolsey, Woolsey is equally a complex character. He's he's obviously uh, the things that used to be said about him that he was this medieval figure and he was arrogant and and all the rest of it. Um, and he probably was. Um, he probably could be bombastic. Um, he clung to the symbols of office, like um, the descriptions of him having whenever he goes to work. You know, we get on the tube or whatever. Um, he came out of York Place, which was his uh, palace. Uh, uh, near Westminster as the Archbishop of York, and he'd have his uh, cardinal's hat uh, before him in procession. He'd have the the two uh, pillars of, of his authority as a legate. He'd have his crosses um, as um, the legate as an Archbishop of York, um, and various other paraphernalia of his power. And people, he, I think, clung to those things because they were all about. The authority that he was given by Henry and by the papacy, and people had to respect him, etc. But I think it just—you can see why he does it, and you can see why other people just go, "Oh God, he's so arrogant," and you know, um, because he's a—he is a, a boy from Ipswich who who is now dwelling in in a world which is just totally removed from where he could possibly have imagined he could be, and I. Um, I have a sort of sympathy or a kind of understanding how he might feel like, like I think I do anyway, um, for whatever reason. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and just seeing what he, what he does. I, I would love to ask him if I ever got to meet him, just how did you do it all? <laughs> how could you be on the one hand negotiating peace with the King of France while getting money out of the church for this? And it, it was extraordinary. These, these people are fascinating, the people who aren't in power that seem to change events. Uh, the yes. most one for me is Farage, who's never been in power, but he seems mm. to have brought a situation in history about. It's as, mm. It is strange, this need and, and, and running theme of people at the top needing these people underneath to kind of make yes. it happen, I suppose. That's right. Um, uh, I mean, they, everybody, ha Francis has, um, not, he's not the equivalent of, of, of Wolsey by any means, but his, his great courtier, um, uh, somewhat confusingly called Anne, although he's a man, Anne de Montmorency, um, Anne used to be a, a name that could be used for men and women, a bit like Glenn, um, can be for men or women, but, um, and he was, he, he had a very uh, similar career in, in, in some ways to, to Wolsey. He was Francis's right-hand man, uh, he wasn't a cleric. He he was on the um, he, was a, he was a secular noble, but um, he uh, ran the royal household. He ran foreign policy. Uh, uh, the the great concept of the favourite Charles V has a number of of uh, and as does Philip II. Uh, as you say, the people in power seem to need key figures, which is why I'm all, I always tell my students that that modern perceptions of monarchy are are very bizarre in some ways. The the idea that monarchy was a system of government where there was one person and they said and everybody else did. Um, it, it, it isn't like that. Monarchy is, uh, there's no such thing as you know, individual rule, I think. It, it's, always, it's always oligarchies of, of some sort. It's always collectives. Uh, okay, there might be one final person and that's how monarchy operates, but but it's, um, it's always a collective of people and each tells you about the other the other side, so it's it's endlessly fascinating. Um, uh, I, I think people like David Starkey and, and others have made the court of Henry VIII um, 
even more fascinating than many others because of that reason. There is that sense of uh, this word faction and, and um, for example, you know, was Woolsey battling against a faction of courtiers who were all working together to get rid of him or was he not? Was he trying to get rid of a group of courtiers that, that he didn't like um, likewise? Um, and that stuff, whether it's, you know, Caligula or <laughs> Henry VIII or Ronald Reagan or what, um, whoever you, the, the, you're right, there's, there's always, and that, that's what interests me, it's that second echelon of people that interests me more than the monarchs themselves. Have you any idea where you're going to turn your laser-like attention to next? I am uh, thinking and talking about um, possibly doing uh, 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 what I would call a, a biography of the court of Henry VIII, which is a weird thing. Um, I can try, I'm, I'm still thinking about it, but because I've, I've, I've come out of and I've contributed to court history and the, exactly the kinds of things we're talking about, so much of that, and again, I don't want to be disparaging of, of some very successful authors who um, have made far more money than I ever will. Um, uh, the personalities and the, you know, did Anne Boleyn do this or drop a handkerchief or, you know, all that sort of stuff, which, which I know fascinates um, and which I want to deal with. But I want to try and get people to see, well, uh, all of that happened in a context, in, in, in a court, in a set of buildings, in a set of institutions, in a set of behaviours um, each day, um, how, how, the, how the monarchy works. So um, you can see it's still very, still very embryonic. But trying to tell the history of the reign of Henry through the institutional history of the court without turning it into a dry and dusty account of, you know, um, exchequer papers and this. Uh, does that make any sense? Probably doesn't yet, but uh, that, that's what I'm trying to do, to, to, to try and sort of re-energise the idea of, of court studies on Henry VIII, but take it away from all the tittle-tattle in, in a way, or put the tittle-tattle in a, in a better context, because I find that my students know all about and increasingly turn to the kind of tittle-tattle side of things but have no real appreciation of the, the structural um, uh, way in which power actually operates. Um, and that's, since you ask, what I'm thinking of doing next. Oh, yeah, um, context is all. I mean, you can't yes. understand that anything without understanding the context of the society and the times and the mores uh, that were going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. You, you just misinterpret the whole time. In, in that's mind. right, and that's what's the, the great beauty of, of the emergence of, of court history, of court studies, which, you know, David and others have done a lot to do. Um, seeing the, uh, that, that's how I really got started in, in all of this, the, the concept of the court as a, as a political um, mechanism and, and uh, as an organic thing, I think is so we can, we can talk about the court of Boris Johnson or Tony Blair or Donald Trump or Barack Obama. Um, or the chief executive, you know, um, uh, of Google or the vice chancellor of my university. <laughs> um, any kind of structural enterprise um, in human history involves the court somehow. Uh, it may not be called one, it, it, it's not the royal court, but it, those, those structures, those, those mechanisms are, are, I think, inherent in, in human organisations. So there we go. Kids have so many pressures on them nowadays. They do. Mm. Mm. Uh, if you were confronted by one, why would you say, why do you think that history is important? Um, well, I would say to them that history is um, a way of engaging with who we are collectively, who they are uh, individually. Uh, I, I don't believe that those who don't know their history are condemned to repeat it and that history repeats itself and all the kind of conventional cliches that say why well, you should study history. I think it's a good uh, intellectual activity to take a piece of, inf to, to distinguish between um, information, which with, as you've said, they are absolutely bombarded in a way um, I never was, you know, at their age. Um, it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, we don't ask them to do what uh, we were asked to do uh, when we were their age, but then neither do we have to deal with the world that they have to deal with. 
But yeah, that distinction between knowledge, uh, sort of information and actual knowledge um, and taking a body of, of information and turning it into knowledge, evidence, what that is, that develops skills of logical thinking, it develops skills of clear expression, it develops uh, or should develop skills um, of um, deduction. Uh, I made the reference earlier to similarities with, with law and, and things. Um, uh, it, it has a lot in common with that. And it's the sense of, of who we are and, and why we do the kinds of things we do. What, why do politicians behave the way they do? Why do, why are families, um, you know, why are different levels and classes in society as they are? All those things make you question, make you think, and it makes you a more uh, engaged citizen, I suppose. It sounds very high for Luton, but... Um, I think we need those kind of people precisely because of the age we live in, which is bombarded with information, and we know all about <laughs> Mr. Speaking Mr. Trump and others. Um, quite conscious efforts to to bamboozle us with false information and false arguments, and I think all of that. It doesn't have to be history. It can be theology. It can be English literature. If you're not scientifically minded, if you're not sort of economically driven or whatever. Uh, which a lot of, of young people aren't, at, you know, when they are young, then I think history is is, is a good discipline and it's an interesting uh, way of look, looking at the world, understanding things. Um, and it can lead to lots of other opportunities. The kinds of, uh, I, I do really believe that the kinds of skills you develop if you study history properly and you really put your mind to it, you can then use in uh, um, Goodness sake, don't become an academic historian. Make no money. <laughs> I tell my student, go and get a proper job. <laughs> um, but, and, and, but you can. Um, and also employers, as I also say to them, employers, um, they still think history is very credible. You know, they're, they're not so sure about media studies, um, but they're very sure that history is credible. And they, they think they know what a history degree is. They're wrong, but don't let them know. Um, uh, it's still kosher. So that's fine. <laughs>